Thank you very much and good morning everyone. I'm really pleased and honored to, to be here and I want to thank Michael Cloud and the CEO of the Milken Institute for his friendship and introduction and of course uh, to Mike Milken uh, who's been a friend to me for 40 years uh, and someone I respect a great deal. Uh, Minister uh, for Trade and Industry uh, Iswaran, thank you uh, for your very uh, erudite and uh, optimistic and encouraging remarks and I certainly enjoyed our meeting uh, earlier. And to all the distinguished guests, allow me to uh, acknowledge uh, my colleagues uh, who are here from Generation Investment Management, my partner and co-founder uh, Colin LeDuc, um, uh, my uh, colleagues uh, Mark Mills and Renee uh, Beaumont, uh, and to all of the other uh, distinguished guests who are here. I'm going to show you some pictures, uh, some slides, uh, and at this point, uh, where the climate crisis is concerned, there are really only three questions remaining. Do we really have to change? We still rely on fossil fuels for 80% of the world's energy, and they have brought many benefits, uh, uh, improvements in standards of living, reductions in poverty, all of the elaborate uh, benefits of our civilization. And so naturally, many people uh, will continue to pause on that first question, must we change? Uh, and I'm going to show you why the scientific community and uh, really the, the world community after the Paris uh, meeting believes the answer to that question is a resounding yes. The second question after must we change is can we change because if we have to change and we don't have the ability to change then that's a formula for depression uh, and anxiety and uh, uh, let's just party on. Uh, but the third and most important uh, question is, will we change? Now, when I present some of the evidence uh, on why uh, so many have come to the conclusion that, yes, we really do have to change, we must change, and urgently, don't get depressed because uh, it's inevitable that some of the evidence uh, that uh, shows why we really have to undertake this difficult task uh, involves some things that are hard to hear. But be reassured that the answer to the second question, can we change, is really very optimistic and, and hopeful. Uh, the answer to that question is yes uh, also. And I am convinced that the answer uh, to the third question, uh, will we change, uh, is, is also yes. I'm going to present all uh, this in about 40 minutes. Uh, and I'm going to try to set it in the context of the investment uh, community uh, because some of the changes necessary to solve the climate crisis involve examining some of the assumptions that have been a part uh, of uh, market economics and the investment community for a while. But let me uh, begin by, if we can put this uh, first picture up there, uh, I always start with uh, pictures uh, of the Earth from space. This is Earthrise, which was taken on December uh, 24, 1968, by the first Apollo mission to scout for landing sites. It didn't land. Uh, they were focused on the surface of the moon, looking for places to land. And uh, one of the astronauts noticed out of the corner of his eye this startling image. And it was like a family uh, on a vacation in a car, he said, where's my camera? Get my camera. Where's the film? Uh, and this picture actually exploded in the consciousness of people uh, here on Earth when it was first seen. It really changed uh, our awareness of the planet we call home. This is the last picture taken by an, a, a human being from far enough in space to see the planet whole. This is the most commonly published photograph in all of history. It was taken on the last Apollo mission on the way back from the moon between the uh, Earth and the moon at a moment when the sun and the Earth and the moon were all lined up so the full disk of the Earth is illuminated. So I begin with these images to set the context for the ways of thinking 
that are now uh, uh, becoming urgent uh, in examining where we go uh, in markets uh, from here. Many of us believe that we are in the early stages of a sustainability revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. It is empowered by the new digital tools available now. Uh, AI is being added to it. The Internet of Things will soon have more than 50 billion connected uh, devices and then will grow rapidly after that. And this sustainability revolution is proceeding very quickly to align the new sources of growth with a zero emission future, uh, a healthy and equitable and safe society. Uh, this transition, I believe, represents the single largest business and investment opportunity in all of human history. To put it in the context of the well-known uh, revolutions, our Civilization has gone through the agricultural revolution, centralized food production led to the rise of the first uh, cities and the generation of surpluses and the growth of population. The industrial revolution uh, concentrated the use of power-driven machines and reshuffled the global economic order. Uh, actually, what we're seeing now in the world is uh, a reversion to long-term mean because as most of you know, for most of the last 2,000 years, China and India have been the two most powerful economies in the world, but the Industrial Revolution triggered a quarter of a millennium breakout by the United Kingdom and Western Europe and the American colonies, and now with our interconnected uh, world, the inherent advantages of the large population and talented uh, people in China and India uh, are reverting to long-term mean. At least that's what many of us believe. The digital revolution more recently was the fastest uh, change that the world uh, has been through. It is still uh, gaining uh, momentum. Um, some people were fooled in the spring of 2000 to thinking that the bursting of the internet bubble meant that it was pre prematurely over and some investors took a bath, but it wasn't long before it came back stronger than ever and it is still uh, gaining strength. A and it, I mentioned AI, of course, as many of you know, that's really a very important new development. The sustainability revolution, as I've mentioned, has the, the scale of both the agricultural and industrial revolutions, but it does have the speed of the digital revolution. So how can investors navigate this unprecedented period of change? Uh, I believe that uh, we have to examine some assumptions that used to seem true, but no longer are. For 150 years, uh, I choose that date because that's roughly when the first oil well was drilled and joined up with coal to provide the carbon-based energy on which we still rely. And we've assumed that the Earth's natural systems have a more or less limited capacity for self-renewal. But the rapidly increasing impacts of growth as we presently define growth have revealed this assumption to be false. Uh, the ecological system of the planet is now colliding, uh, we are now colliding with the ecological system of the planet. Uh, the, the weight of plastics in the ocean will soon exceed the weight of all the fish in the oceans, the destruction of forests and wetlands, the accumulation of toxic pollutants, uh, there, there are many examples, but by far the most serious uh, aspect of this collision is the radical change to the composition of the atmosphere. Um, so it's fair to ask the question, uh, have we been partially blind to the consequences of some of our economic decisions? Now here, if you will allow me, I want to uh, introduce uh, an analogy. Uh, everybody remembers uh, learning years ago about the electromagnetic spectrum, which goes from the uh, very short wave gamma rays to the very long, waves, uh, long wave radio waves, and the portion that's made up of visible light is one-tenth of one percent. But that's what we concentrate on, and we assume that the rest of it 
uh, is of marginal relevance. I had the experience of working for eight years in the White House and starting every single day with at least an hour-long briefing from the Central Intelligence Agency, which, as you may have read, collects information from the full spectrum. Um, <laughs> and I found uh, the, the images and explanations provided uh, from the full spectrum were much more uh, meaningful. But because of human nature, we tend to concentrate on what we can see. Uh, the, Optical systems occupy 70% of the brain, uh, and so we ignore these other parts of the spectrum. Something like that uh, is happening in our view of the value spectrum. By focusing on the Bloomberg terminals and quarterly reports and those things that are routinely measured in streams of numbers, we sometimes fall prey to ignoring parts of the value spectrum that are outside what is reported. Uh, and this is uh, a, a well-known uh, psychological glitch that uh, each of us individually has. But now, uh, in markets, this is a, a very serious uh, problem. Traditional fan uh, financial metrics are famously short-term. And value investors understand that uh, uh, it, it's important to look at the, the, the natural maturation of uh, real value in businesses. But we have seen a foreshortening of the time horizons that many investors uh, feel are important. But beyond short-termism, the metrics we use typically ignore a number of important factors. Negative externalities, that's probably the best known. Pollution uh, uh, is a, a famous uh, negative externality. It's not really measured in GDP or in the national accounts that are derived from GDP. Less well known are positive externalities. If a community or a nation invests in education, mental health care, community services, it's registered as an expense. But the benefits and income that come rolling in uh, in the years following are not registered as income to offset the expense. Uh, third, uh, natural resource uh, depletion is not measured. And the emergence of inequality, and in these days, hyper inequality, in the distribution of incomes and net worths uh, are not is not measured either. The inventor of GDP in the national accounts in the late 1930s, Simon Kuznets, was honored for his invention. And he made a round of speeches saying, please do not use these measures as a guide for national uh, economic policies. But seven years later at Bretton Woods, it was codified, uh, and we still uh, use it. But they, th these uh, neglected items, plus the short-term horizons, cause us to ignore a great deal of the value spectrum that is now increasingly important. This is um, an image from the space station that illustrates a fundamental truth about the sky that conflicts with our visceral impression of the sky. It looks from the ground to be a limitless expanse, but it's actually an extremely thin shell surrounding the planet. Uh, we are using this as an open sewer for the gaseous waste streams of our civilization. Uh, every day we're putting 110 million tons of man-made heat trapping global warming pollution into this space. And because it's thinner than we suppose, the chemical composition of the sky is being, being radically altered to trap a lot more heat. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, we're, we're filling it up. Uh, CO2 is the largest uh, source of the heat trapping global warming pollution. Uh, and don't worry about all the details on this slide, but I want to show it because CO2 is far from the only greenhouse gas pollution. It's just the most prominent. Agri industrial agriculture and factory farming makes up about 15 percent. Uh, the management of forests and the burning of forests uh, Mining, uh, transportation is in the fossil fuel bucket. 
now the thawing of the Arctic uh, permafrost is beginning to worry uh, scientists. But by far the largest part of this man-made heat-trapping pollution is the emission of CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels. And as you can see, after World War II, the accumulation started rising very rapidly. And, and then after uh, the collapse of the Berlin Wall and uh, the uh, global uh, interconnection, uh, it started rising faster still. Now, a spoiler alert, uh, if you look at the upper right-hand corner, it's hard to see, but you see that line flattening out? For the last three years, global emissions have stabilized. And from two years ago to last year, there was actually the first slight decline uh, that occurred not in a, a recession year. Uh, in, in any case, the cumulative amount that is up there now traps as much extra heat energy every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours uh, here on Earth. And it's a big planet, but that is an enormous amount uh, of energy. And it is increasing the amount of energy trapped and increasing temperatures. Now, this is the only complicated slide, and it's not that complicated. It's a bell curve. Uh, and it shows the distribution of air temperature around the world between 1951 and 1980. It's sort of arbitrarily labeled as normal for sake of comparison. The blue represents cooler than average days. The white are normal temperature days, and the red are warmer than average days. Uh, in the 1980s, the curve shifted to the right, and you see in the lower right-hand corner the first appearance of a statistically significant number of extremely hot days. Then in the 1990s, the, the shift continued, and in the last 10 years, the extremely hot days have become more numerous than the cooler than average days. Uh, and these extremely hot days drive a lot of change. They have become almost 150 times more common than they were just 30 years ago. As a result, we see the increase in global temperatures since the 1880s when the first uh, measurements with instruments uh, took place. Uh, and you see the uh, increase is really quite uh, pronounced now. This is in Singapore, by the way. Uh, we do not have uh, 2011 through 2017 uh, for, for this uh, graph, but you can see the same pattern. Globally, 16 of the 17 hottest years ever measured have been uh, since 2001. The hottest of all was last year. The second hottest was the year before. The third hottest was the year before that. The pattern is pretty clear. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, earlier this month, it reached 41.1 degrees, uh, an all-time record uh, in the Australian uh, summer, 47.2 degrees uh, in uh, Sydney, uh, in Athens, uh, 43 degrees, uh, in Quetta, Pakistan, 54 degrees. Uh, this was in uh, Turkey during a high temperature episode I'll show you in a, in a moment. Some of our infrastructure built for a world we no longer live in is succumbing. The streets are melting. This is uh, in Gujarat last year. <laughs> They're going to come over and help her. She's OK. Got a whole collection of these. This was in Kuwait City uh, in July. The pavement melted and the truck sank into the pavement. What do we do now? This has happened with airlines, uh, airplanes in the US. Uh, I mentioned Kuwait City, 51 degrees in July uh, of this year. Birds were falling out of the sky from the heat. This was in Turkey uh, in, at the end of uh, June, 53.7. This was in the United Arab Emirates, 51.5.
Now, on a global basis, this is a really uh, significant uh, fact. Uh, all of the changes in temperature I've just showed you come from the 7% that goes into the air, 93% goes into the oceans. And this is causing a dramatic increase uh, in the buildup of heat in, in the oceans. Um, th this has several consequences. The first order consequences is that ocean-based storms get stronger. Uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan uh, that hit the Philippines a few years ago, they called it uh, Yolanda, they have a separate uh, naming system there, became up until recently the strongest ocean-based storm ever. Hurricane Irma last week uh, broke that record while at sea. It caused 4.1 million climate uh, refugees, uh, killed thousands of people. Pope Francis uh, came in the immediate aftermath and delivered a really important message that is part of the fundamental character of the climate crisis. The poor suffer the most. That's in every country and in every part of the world. Uh, two weeks ago in my country, uh, uh, Hurricane Harvey passed over waters four degrees warmer, up to four degrees warmer than normal. Uh, and there were several unusual things. Not only was the ocean water much hotter, uh, it extended heat all the way down 200 meters. Uh, often hurricanes, when they approach the coast, they'll churn up colder water from the bottom and that short circuits the energy the hurricane needs. But the water was hot all the way down. Uh, and this hurricane was held over Houston for four days. Uh, and the consequences, you may have seen it in the news media, were really quite extreme. Why was it held uh, there for four days? This actually is a little bit complicated. You're looking down at the North Pole and you're seeing the Northern Hemisphere jet stream go around the North Pole. We'll tilt it up to see North America. The jet stream is changing. You see it becomes a lot wavier and these loops and it becomes at times disorganized. That's what happened with Hurricane Harvey. Two high pressure systems locked it in place for four days. The amount of water uh, was uh, 125 billion uh, cubic meters. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Niagara Falls. It's the equivalent of 500 days worth of Niagara Falls. The consequences were really uh, quite astounding and uh, tragic. This is, uh, this is something I'll, I'll come back to, but you see the part of it was over the land and part of it was over the ocean. Uh, and I'll come back to it because what happens when it's over the ocean is it picks up the water vapor coming off uh, the oceans. So you, you had a, 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 an incredibly unprecedented uh, tragedy. Uh, th these were people in an old folks uh, retirement home uh, sitting waist deep in water waiting to be rescued. They were uh, rescued, although this morning, uh, Eight uh, senior citizens died uh, uh, in Florida, were found dead uh, because of the, there's still 15 million people without electricity in the state of Florida from Hurricane Irma last week, and they died uh, in the uh, extra heat. Uh, there were a lot of courageous uh, rescues, a lot of uh, inspiring uh, stories, but also a lot of interaction with the petrochemical industry centered uh, in Houston, four Superfund sites uh, leaking into the floodwaters, and we don't have time to go into all of that. It was the most rainfall ever recorded in the continental uh, U.S. Um, uh, this was the third one in 500 year flood in, the, in each of the last three years. I had a training of climate activists in Houston last year and remarked on the fact that in the previous two years they had had these record floods, and this was the second once in a thousand year downpour. And then last week, uh, Hurricane Irma uh, spared most of the continental US uh, the kind of damage that was feared. But of course, you may have seen in the news the devastation in the Caribbean islands uh, and in Cuba, uh, and, and uh, it was bigger than the entire state of uh, Florida. Cuba suffered uh, a major uh, blow. But Miami Beach on the other side of the state uh, also uh, 
uh, suffered a lot. Uh, this is part of the Florida Keys, uh, South Carolina up the coast. Uh, so the second order consequences of the heating of the oceans involves this increase in water evaporation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is not water, it's water vapor. It comes off the oceans and into the sky, and this is elementary stuff that we all learned a long time ago. But this water cycle that takes the water vapor over the land where it falls as precipitation and works its way back to the ocean, this is becoming supercharged and accelerated quite uh, dramatically. This is a, uh, what's called an atmospheric river. Uh, here is uh, California, Northern California. In the lower left is Hawaii, and you see that well-defined atmospheric river traveling 2,300 kilometers, and at the terminus of the river uh, on this particular day is San Jose. Uh, these uh, storms are growing in size and intensity. Uh, and the area, the, the rain that falls on the ground doesn't come from the part of the sky directly above where it falls always. It's transported by these atmospheric rivers. Watch this storm splash off the city of Tucson. They're calling these rain bombs now. And they're happening uh, all over the world uh, with great frequency. Uh, this is the record of... Uh, uh, precipitation anomalies in the last few years. This is getting worse. It's getting worse quickly. It's going to continue to get worse until we do something about it. And even when we do something about it, it's going to take a little time to get back to a sustainable uh, pattern. Uh, today, the water is waist deep uh, in uh, Manila as well as Quezon uh, City. This picture was taken Two years ago, I think the water has subsided a bit by uh, today. Um, at the same time, the world's news media, uh, most of the world's news media was focused on Houston, Texas. A uh, hundred times as many people were killed in India and Nepal and Bangladesh uh, and in Pakistan. Mumbai got a month's worth of rain uh, in one day. 70 centimeters over and above what the normal monsoon brings. 16 million children uh, are affected in South Asia. One third of Bangladesh was underwater uh, last week. 700,000 homes damaged or destroyed. At the same exact time when the attention was focused on Houston, Texas, 100,000 people displaced in Nigeria. This was earlier this summer uh, in Japan. This was actually last year in China. I include it because this did $33 billion worth of damage, the third most expensive uh, flood in history outside of North America. Uh, this was earlier this year in Guangzhou, 145 millimeters in 24 hours. This was in Spain a couple of uh, years ago. This was in Chile a couple of uh, years ago. You can see this warehouse uh, going by, and you'll see the oil tanker cars going by in the opposite, uh, from the opposite shore. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an escape from Hades by a woman who was caught in a flood earlier this year in Peru. Got a whole collection of these uh, near-death experiences. Uh, England, um, a year and a half ago, had the worst downpour in its history, but the pubs remained open. There will always be an England. Uh, the inside of that window is just uh, spotless. So here's an important point. You will often hear people, even today, after Hurricane Harvey and after Hurricane Irma, you will still hear the media struggling with the expression that you cannot attribute any particular storm to the climate crisis. There is a difference between linear causation, single cause, single effect, and systemic causation. When a complex system generates multiple 
uh, effects and you radically change the complex system, then all of the consequences are different. Every storm uh, is different now because of all the extra water vapor uh, and heat energy. Uh, the reinsurance industry is very clear about this. Now, the same extra heat that causes the disruption of the water cycle, the stronger ocean-based storms and the bigger downpours, also causes deeper and longer droughts. And Asia has seen more than its share of these historic droughts. This summer uh, in Inner Mongolia was an all-time record drought. Iran, by the way, is part of ground zero for the climate crisis. This is Lake Ermia. Uh, many causes of this, but mainly the uh, incredible temperatures. Uh, in South Africa, a, an incredible uh, drought underway there now. The United Nations, as you may know, has warned yet again this month that we are now facing the worst humanitarian disaster since 1945, with 20 million people, according to the UN, uh, nearing starvation. Because uh, several parts of Africa, including the southern cone, are experiencing this uh, historic drought. Where there's drought and, and where there is high temperature, there are more fires. Uh, this was uh, last week in the state of Washington. You don't want to interrupt the golf game. Um, this was uh, the largest fire in the history of Los Angeles uh, earlier this month, and in Santa Barbara this summer, and in British Columbia. The biggest fires aren't really pictured because they're in the Arctic and in Siberia. Uh, this was in Chile earlier this year, a million uh, acres. Uh, you may have seen the coverage of this horrible event in Portugal, Australia, uh, and Russia. I'm showing you this uh, because it's a recent satellite photo of the fires in Siberia, uh, but I'm showing it uh, because it recalls an historic event seven years ago, the largest fire in Russia's history after the worst drought in Russia's history, 55,000 people died. But four months after this event, uh, something else happened. Russia took all of its grain off world markets. Uh, Ukraine took much of its off. And world food prices reached an all-time record high for the second time in three years. And there were food riots in 60 countries, in South Asia, uh, in South America, and in North Africa, including at the peak of these food prices, a food vendor in uh, Tunisia set himself on fire. And his last words were not down with the tyrant. His last words were, how can I live? And the disruptions associated with the climate crisis have also been evident in Syria. Long before the Civil War began in Syria, a, an all-time record drought, the worst in 900 years of record keeping, destroyed 60% of the farms in Syria, killed 80% of their livestock, and drove one and a half million people into the cities where they collided with another one and a half million refugees from the Iraq War. The US Department of Defense has long warned uh, that the climate crisis will lead to food and water shortages, pandemic disease, and refugees. And the flows of refugees from Syria and from the eastern Mediterranean region uh, and from the Middle East and North Africa uh, have had knock-on consequences uh, in Europe and, in, and elsewhere. Uh, we have seen problems in the European Union, and actually the single most powerful advertisement during the Brexit campaign was this billboard, which was everywhere in the UK, showing an endless line of refugees from the Middle East and North Africa knocking at the door of Europe. Uh, and while there were many causes of these, these refugees and many causes of the Brexit uh, vote, this is uh, an indication of some of the challenges uh, that the world is going to face because of climate refugees. Again, we need to take hold of this because the scientists are saying, including at the Max Planck Institute, that we are now in danger of seeing significant parts of the Middle East and North Africa becoming uninhabitable. Uninhabitable, which will add to the pressure to migrate. The heat index, the combination of heat and humidity, 
reached 74 degrees in a city uh, in Iran uh, two years ago. Uh, the holy cities of Mecca and Medina uh, are, are now installing these misters, and they are within the zone that scientists are warning uh, could become uninhabitable. Agriculture is also affected because in the last seven to eight years, the scientists have zeroed in on the surprising sensitivity of food crops to heat stress. There are many other aspects. I have a whole presentation on agriculture that we obviously don't have time for. I have a whole presentation on the, on the impact on human health. I'll just say briefly that the relationship between humans and microbes has always been mediated by climate. And what we're seeing now is the migration of tropical diseases to higher latitudes, and air travel has had a lot to do with this, but the places where these diseases become endemic are profoundly affected by the climate crisis. And the most recent uh, warning sign is uh, Zika. This is uh, one of the experts who says climate change is shifting, tilting the balance and making the world better for infectious diseases. Uh, the carriers of these diseases, like this particular mosquito that's implicated in Zika and dengue fever, made part of the U.S. Uh, for the first time, issue warnings for pregnant women not to uh, travel there. Uh, it's better this year, but there were many regions in South and Central America where doctors t advise women not to get pregnant for two years until they get a handle on this. Now, that should be like a warning bell in the night. Waterborne diseases, they're dealing with this in Houston and in Texas and in Florida and Louisiana now. More than two-thirds of the waterborne disease outbreaks come in the wake uh, of these incredible downpours. Uh, air pollution, the co-pollutants, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but you know that in India and in China, uh, air pollution has become uh, a political issue. Six and a half million people around the world are killed every year, and the amount of mercury from uh, coal burning is also causing problems. The warming oceans and acidification are threatening all of the coral reefs. We now risk losing half of all the land-based species uh, on the planet in this century. Animal and uh, plant species are moving poleward at the rate of four and a half meters per day on our watch. Some of them are running out of spaces to go. This was a big storm that also moved poleward. Uh, this was a year and a half ago, came across the Midwest of the US and caused a lot of disruption went on up to the North Pole, and in the middle of the polar winter night, the North Pole started thawing. 28 degree increase in temperature. I was in Greenland uh, last year, uh, right after a big temperature spike. This is uh, methane, these are methane uh, releases from a frozen lake uh, in Siberia. This, I mentioned earlier that the scientist, she's okay. Um, are a little worried about where that's going. This is uh, uh, farther east in Siberia. Um, that's a methane bubble, like a blister. Sometimes they do this. That's not uh, an entrance crater, that's an exit crater from the methane exploding. Uh, so the land-based ice is melting. This is a glacier in Greenland, now completely gone. This is NASA's uh, depiction of how the mass in Greenland has been declining. Uh, when I was there, there was a huge increase uh, in temperature uh, in Ilulisat, uh, Greenland. These glaciers are literally exploding from the in incredible uh, heat temperature. Uh, Antarctica is uh, an even larger land-based mass of ice, and, and Greenland and Antarctica together are now contributing to an accelerated level of, uh, uh, an accelerated amount of sea level rise. The top cities at risk are in Asia. If you measure by assets at risk, the number one city at risk is Miami. Uh, I conducted a training there uh, two years ago. This is on a sunny day, no rainfall. It's just a high tide. Uh, this is something you don't see every day, an octopus in a parking garage. We talked to the photographer who did that. Of course, uh, Singapore uh, is vulnerable. 
uh, and Singapore has come to grips uh, with this. Uh, just uh, earlier this year with the uh, National Climate Change Secretariat focusing on this. So must we change uh, all of the costs of, of carbon? Uh, I haven't even talked about acidification or some of these others. I'll mention one other. For the third year in a row, the World Economic Forum in Davos has named the climate crisis the number one threat to the global economy. Uh, we have $22 trillion worth of subprime carbon assets. When their value will collapse, I can't predict, but it's almost certainly within the time horizon relevant to long-term investors. So must we change? Yes. Can we change? Here's the good news. We have the solutions uh, at hand, and it's very exciting. Uh, we see some of the core areas in uh, power, mobility, food, health and well-being. I don't have time to cover all of them, but I want to talk about uh, renewable energy, digitalized uh, grids, uh, uh, and prosumers. Uh, wind energy, the best projections uh, uh, in, in the year 2000 were that we would reach 30 gigawatts by 2010. We exceeded that goal 16 times over. Uh, we've seen a, an exponential curve in the in the deployment uh, of wind in many areas. Uh, it's now cheaper than electricity from fossil fuels. Uh, in June of this year, for the entire month, Scotland got 100% of its energy from wind. The home of the coal revolution now gets more electricity from wind than coal. Other countries are going for days on end uh, with just renewables. On a global basis, wind could supply 40 times all the energy needed by the world. Energy storage, principally batteries, are now exhibiting a cost reduction curve and an explosion in deployment. Uh, you can see the large lithium ion battery. And the combination of affordable batteries and renewable energy is transforming the energy sector. Solar energy, the best projections 15 years ago were that the world could add one gigawatt per year by 2010. When 2010 came around, we exceeded that goal 17 times over. Last year, uh, we exceeded 75 times over. This exponential curve is even steeper. It is still growing uh, quite dramatically because the cost of the cells is coming down and the whole system cost is declining even more rapidly. The trend is toward grid parity. Uh, what is grid parity? Well, it's the line below which unsubsidized solar is cheaper than unsubsidized uh, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, it's a bit like the difference between zero degrees and one degree. That's a difference of more than one degree. It, it's the difference between ice and water. And in markets, it's the difference between capital that's frozen up and liquid flows of investments looking at the new opportunities. In 2010, uh, global investments in renewables crossed over and exceeded uh, investments in fossil. The projections are that this gap will increase. If you add nuclear to it, it will increase uh, even more. Uh, now, the subsidies for fossil fuels are 40 times larger than the subsidies for renewables on a global basis, 26x uh, in the U.S. There is agreement to phase those out. Here's a, a precedent for this. Uh, some of you remember uh, the telephone transition in 1980, AT&T uh, asked for a study of these, you know, those first generation big clunky mobile phones. I thought they looked so cool. Uh, uh, McKinsey said, okay, good news. By 2000, you can sell 900,000 of these. And actually, uh, th they sold 900,000 in the first three days and 120 times that before it was over with. There are now more cell phone connections than people. So why were they not only wrong, but way wrong? I've asked that question myself. Um, and I think the answer is uh, threefold. The cost dropped quicker than anyone expected, even as the quality improved. And in the low-income countries, you see the, the deployment was much larger because they could leapfrog in the areas with no telephone grids. What about the electricity grids? There are many, uh, there are 300 million people in India that have no electricity at all. They're not going to get it from, from uh, the traditional electricity grid. We're seeing this instead now. Solar panels on uh, roofs of huts and new business models like pay-as-you-go. Uh, we're seeing India do a dramatic change 
Uh, Germany, big industrial country, 86% from renewables. This is an exciting story. Michelle Bachelet, the president of Chile, came back for her second round in office, uh, and their solar commitment went from 11 megawatts uh, to 400 megawatts uh, to 850 megawatts. Here's what they have under construction and approved for construction now. This is a breakout, uh, and it's happening in a lot of places. Uh, it, it's really quite uh, remarkable. They're, they are deploying 13 gigawatts. Uh, Morocco, the story is uh, actually fairly uh, similar. Uh, it's a smaller uh, country, but they're, they're also uh, breaking out now. Um, same is true uh, in uh, Ethiopia. An incredible uh, breakout underway there. Uh, the, the plan is for uh, a huge uh, increase. And I, one last one that I will show you is Algeria, which has the most ambitious uh, plan of all. They plan to go to 22 gigawatts of electricity. And as some of you know, there's a plan to sell this across the Straits of Gibraltar uh, to Europe. So we're seeing uh, an incredible change. And enough solar energy reaches the Earth every hour to supply the entire world's energy use for a full year. Big employment opportunities, so almost 10 million people already employed in renewables. In the U.S., solar jobs growing 17 times faster than other jobs. As someone said yesterday, uh, the single fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. Retrofitting of the built environment is very employment intensive. Singapore, Mr. Minister, uh, has certified almost 2,000 new green uh, buildings. You're ahead of the curve. LED is going to capture almost 100% of the lighting market in only eight years. Batteries are coming down very quickly in cost now. This is a revolutionary development. Here is a brand new study uh, showing uh, what's happening for batteries for electric cars. India just announced uh, no more internal combustion engines by 2030. 13 years from now, 100%. Uh, have to be electric. India's not the only one. Norway, 2025. Netherlands uh, looks like 2025. China, they just announced that they're going to phase out, and in the near future, they will pick the date. Scotland, France, Britain. A Angela Merkel said this is the right approach. She's not ready to pick the date yet. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers have announced that they're shifting. Volvo, as of next year, Volkswagen just announced last week all of its models are going electric. Here are all the auto manufacturers around the world that are shifting over uh, to electric vehicles. This is a revolution. And where electricity generation is concerned, in my country last year, 75 percent came from solar and wind, the new electricity generation. All these coal plants were proposed and defeated. All these existing plants were retired. The retirement of these was announced. All of them canceled. We are shifting uh, dramatically. China is also beginning to shift. India has closed 37 coal mines uh, this year. Uh, China and India are on track to, to meet uh, and beat their Paris commitments. Uh, France has uh, actually announced that there's going to be no more fossil fuel exploration or production allowed in any French territory as of 2040. You want a, a global revolution in energy? It is now beginning. And CO2 emissions, as I mentioned, have started to stabilize. But this is not good enough. We have to move faster. And the Paris Agreement brought virtually every country in the world into a shared commitment to go to net zero by mid-century or as soon uh, thereafter as possible. Yes, President Trump announced that he's uh, withdrawing, but the U.S. is going to meet its commitments under Paris anyway. And by the way, I was sharing with the minister earlier, uh, the earliest date under the Paris Agreement that the U.S. could legally withdraw from the Paris Agreement happens to be the day after the next presidential election <laughs> in 2020. And if there is a new president, excuse me a moment, <laughs> then a new president, you can't put quotation marks around that, uh, a new president could simply give 30 days notice uh, and the U.S. would be back in. Uh, here is Goldman Sachs' uh, view. Uh, what's driving this is not politics, it's innovation. 
global markets and investors. And this is going to continue regardless of who occupies the White House. May I also uh, conclude by reminding you that publics around the world, including these 400,000 people marching in the streets on the eve of the UN meeting, are insisting that we move forward. Uh, and I'm very optimistic. We have to change. We can change. I'm optimistic that we will change. This is, uh, I, I, well, there are two screens. I was going to show you where I am in this uh, crowd. I never thought that I would be part of a crowd surrounding the White House. <laughs> but you got to do what you got to do. So in conclusion, I want to quote a line from one of my favorite poets in the US, Wallace Stevens. He wrote these lines, after the last no comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. Every one of the great social revolutions that has advanced the cause of humanity has encountered no after no after no until the last no was followed by a yes. When the central issue was refined into a clear choice between what's right and what's wrong. We have the opportunity to invest and create jobs and renew the global economy and say to our kids and grandkids, we did the right thing. And for anybody who doubts that we have the political will to pull this off, just remember that political will is itself a renewable resource. Thank you very much.